Greetings, everyone, and welcome to God Save the King. Uh, you can listen to God Save the King every Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern on the Truth Be Told radio network. There's a variety of ways you can listen to TBTRN. You can certainly go to their website and click on the big listen button. You can also, of course, listen on Alexa, Google, and Apple home devices. You can call in on your phone because by the way, your phone is a smart device. You can call in on your phone, 641-741-2866 or 717-567-4977 and listen that way. And of course, also there's the Android app, there's MyTuner, Wi-Fi radio, and TuneIn radio. All of these are ways you can listen to my show, God Save the King, Friday at 10 p.m. Eastern, and any other of the great shows that are on the Truth Be Told radio network. So tonight, I want to do something um, similar to what we did last time. I think it was last time, or maybe it was two weeks ago. <clears throat> I did a sharing uh, last week or the week before where we, I spent quite a bit of time talking about the Abrahamic covenant and then the subsequent covenants that would have formulated the Jewish mindset that would have been in place at the time of the birth of Christ, okay? Because what we were talking about was the context, right? What is the religious, the political, and the social context that would have existed not only in Judea on the micro scale, but also in the Near East, the Mediterranean, and frankly, the known world at that time, stretching all the way from Rome all the way to certainly Central Asia, if not the Far East. That would have been the known world at that time. So what would have been the environment, the political environment, the religious environment, the social environment in Judea and the world at that time, right? So as far as the Jewish mindset is considered, you really got to go all the way back to Abraham, right? We have to understand that Abraham was, quote unquote, the first Jew, and that when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, he set certain things in motion that he promised Abraham that he was going to make of him a great nation, and that is the Jewish nation. That's the, the Hebrew nation, what we would call Israel today, that he was going to make of them a great nation that he was going to provide them with a land of his choo choosing, what we now know biblically as the promised land. And as I mentioned uh, during that sharing, the fact that the phrase promised land, that we don't get that from the Exodus. We get that from the Abrahamic covenant. And that's how the Exodus had significance is because this was the land God had promised to Abraham 400 years before the Exodus, okay, at least 400 years, maybe even more. And um, so, and then finally, there is the, um, there's the blessing clause. So we talked about how the Abrahamic covenant divides up very neatly into three categories. There's several different provisions. There's more than three different provisions, but they all line up into three categories really conveniently. The descendant clause, which is primarily about the people, and then also specifically about the Messiah. And then there is the land clause. And then there is the blessing clause. And that the ultimate fulfillment of these covenants for the Jewish nation, for the Hebrew nation, would be when all of these things happen at the same time. That this nation that God would create would occupy the land that he chose for them. And then that he would bless them right? Which to cut through a lot of the rigmarole means that he would indwell them is really what that means. Okay. The blessing clause is that God would indwell his people. See? And so those three categories were then magnified or amplified through the course of the old covenant, the old Testament by three additional covenants. Okay. The Palestinian covenant, we talked about that, how we don't really like that label very much, or what we could simply call the covenant with the land. The covenant with the land amplifies the land clause of the Abrahamic covenant, the, um, pardon me, the uh, Davidic 
covenant amplifies the descendant clause because it goes into greater detail and defines and describes the Messiah as a descendant of David. Okay, hence the Davidic covenant, right? And then finally, the blessing clause. And the blessing clause is the new covenant. And as I mentioned during that episode, that broadcast, that the new covenant technically is not made with the church. The new covenant is made with the nation of Israel. But then due to the fact that the nation of Israel didn't recognize what was going on. Their Messiah was in their midst and they largely did not recognize him. <clears throat> Pardon me. That God still made the new covenant with the nation of Israel because Jesus of Nazareth acted as the representative for the nation because he was the Messiah, the King, the Mashiach Nagid. So he absolutely had the right <laughs> to, uh, you know, uh, cut the covenant with the father to create this covenant relationship between the nation of Israel and God. But Israel didn't really recognize what was going on. So now those of us, since the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, who recognize that he is the Messiah of Israel, we get this special benefit, which is that we get to take part in the new covenant. The new covenant wasn't made with the church of Christ, the church of the body, right? The body of Christ. It was made with the nation of Israel. But nonetheless, we get to benefit from it, okay? And then, like I started to say, the um, ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant and then these three additional covenants that amplify the conditions of the Abrahamic covenant, the ultimate fulfillment is this special time, the messianic age, when Israel, the nation of Israel will be in the land, the Messiah will be present, and God will indwell the nation of Israel. And that has never happened. So part of the reason this so part of the reason I shared that is because at the time of the birth of Christ the nation of Israel would have been looking for that okay because this after all is the foundation of the uh, the nation of Israel and the Hebrew religion uh, you know we give a lot of emphasis to the Torah and the Mosaic Covenant, and well, we should, because it plays a crucial role in the Hebrew religion, but it's actually not the foundation from a certain perspective. It's the Abrahamic Covenant that is the foundation, because it happened long before the Mosaic Covenant did, and the Mosaic Covenant is not the covenant that promises the people, the land, and the blessing. It's the Abrahamic Covenant that does that. So the nation of Israel, the people of Israel at the time of the birth of Christ, they would have still been anticipating the messianic age. And they especially would have been anticipating it in light of the fact that they had now been under foreign domination for something along the lines of, you know, 600 years at this point in time, with the exception of a brief period of independence under the Hasmoneans. And because of that period, of independence under the Hasmoneans, frankly, what that would have done is that that would have actually made messianic expectation all that much more significant and more prominent because while the Hasmoneans were a new type of Judean royalty, a new type of Judeish, uh, pardon me, Jewish royalty, um, it's really questionable whether they were of the house of David and therefore truly legitimate kings. And what the Davidic covenant promises is that there would always be a descendant of David sitting on the throne and that the ultimate fulfillment okay, of those covenant promises would be a Davidic king on the throne, which is very interesting because that means that during the Messianic age, that means you know, God has to do some pretty spectacular things to fulfill his covenant promises to the nation of Israel, okay? So now the secondary reason this is a, a great foundation is not only because of what it means for God save the king in our context, but also, frankly, what it means to the good 
Bible student. If you really want to understand a lot of components of the Bible, having a good grasp of these Old Testament covenants is critical. Uh, I was talking with a friend last night on the phone, and if you want to understand end times, if you want to understand eschatology, you need to understand the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant with the land, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant, and the fact that it is the fulfillment of these covenants is what defines the messianic age. So in other words, what defines the messianic age is God's fulfillment of these covenants with the nation of Israel. Very little eschatological things are defined by the church. They're defined by Israel. So if you want to be in tune with what's going on eschatologically and times, you keep your eye on the nation of Israel. Don't look at the church, look at the nation of Israel. That's what you need to watch, okay? So like I said, understanding the Abrahamic covenant, understanding the additional three covenants that amplify the Abrahamic covenant, um, super critical to understanding the birth of Christ, super critical to understanding the, the mission and ministry of Christ when he was on earth, super critical to understanding eschatology and end times, right? And ironically, I don't think I'm going to go off camera for about two seconds here. One, two, three, okay, four seconds. Okay. I don't have a Bible handy, but so I don't have a, um, do I have one over there? Yes, I do. One sec. All right. So this is for the benefit of those that are watching me on YouTube. For those of you that are just listening uh, on radio, let me describe to you what I'm doing. I have a Bible in my hand. Okay. And see, there it is on camera, Bible, 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 Holy Bible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open my Bible, and I'm going to open my Bible to Genesis chapter 12. Okay, now Genesis chapter 12 is where we are introduced to Abraham, right? Actually, we're introduced to him in 11, but the story really kicks off full speed in uh, Genesis chapter 12, right? So there's Genesis chapter 12, and I'm going to put my finger there and hold that spot. Now I'm going to flip towards the back of the Bible, and I am going to turn to the first page of the book of Acts, okay? So there it is, the first page of the book of Acts, right? Now, for those of you looking on camera, check this out. I am now holding up, and for those of you not watching on camera. You just got to imagine what I'm doing here. I have put my thumb in Genesis 12, and I have put my forefinger in Acts chapter 1, okay? And I am holding that up for the camera, and I've got, you know, a solid inch and a quarter of text between my thumb and my forefinger, okay? Actually, you have to make it Acts chapter 2 to be hyper accurate, but okay, beginning of the book of Acts is just fine. But if you look at my whole Bible here now, if you look at the perspective on screen, there is a ginormous chunk of my Bible between my thumb and my forefinger and a very, very small portion before Genesis 12 and a very, very small portion um, after Acts the book of Acts that is not between my thumb and my forefinger. Now, what, 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 Tim, what, what are you, what, what are you driving at here? What point are you trying to make? So here's the question I want to ask you. There is a single subject matter between my fingers. What is it? Okay. Now I don't have time to wait for dramatic pause because we're on radio. The single subject matter that between is between my fingers is the nation of Israel. Okay. It's the nation of Israel. Now, let me share with you another anecdote that's to help you understand why I'm doing this, okay? It used to be that if a man or a woman wanted to be trained to be a minister, that they would have to go to seminary 
And when in seminary, chances were extraordinarily high that the methodology that they would that would be used to instruct them in how to be a minister was this thing called systematic theology. Okay. Now in many seminaries you can still find that, but a lot of seminaries have changed their methodology over the years. But back in the day, if you studied systematic theology, you would have had to have bought at least one book and frequently an entire volume of books on systematic theology. And it doesn't really matter which author you got these from, whether it was Lewis Sperry Schaefer or, you know, or any of these other guys that wrote systematic theologies, it wouldn't matter which uh, author you chose, the table of contents and then the layout for systematic theology and the methodology is virtually identical, okay? So when you open and so the volumes would be laid out this way or the single book would be laid out this way. So when you open it up and you look at the table of contents, there, chapter one or section one or volume one would be bibliology, okay? The study of the Bible, right? So it would just tell you everything you need to know about the Bible, how we got it, how it's laid out, Old and New Testament, the authors, when books were written, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be segment number one or volume one. Then uh, volume two would be theology proper, or in other words, the study of the Father, right? Volume three would be Christology or the study of Christ. Volume four would be pneumatology or the study of the Holy Spirit. Volume four would be anthropology or the study of man, okay? And then it would go on and on and on and on. And there would be additional chapters or additional segments or additional volumes on angiology, demonology, soteriology, okay, which is um, the study of salvation, harmatology, which is the study of sin, okay, also ecclesiology, which is the study of the church, and then finally eschatology, which is the study of last things or the study of the end times. Now, this is a lot of really fancy words that don't mean much to most of you listening, other than the fact that I'm going to make a point about these fancy terms, right? A couple of things. I mentioned end times. Let me make a point about end times here for a second. Actually, no, I'll, I'll come back. I'll make that point in a minute. Let me make my other point first, because I went through a whole list here of different volumes in systematic theology or different sections, right? Bibliology, theology, Christology, pneumatology, anthropology, angiology, demonology, soteriology, harmatology, ecclesiology, eschatology. Where is Israel? Ology. Where is the study of the nation of Israel as a systematic part of systematic theology? And the it is tragic that it really has not been there. Okay. And I don't have it in front of me, but part of the reason I know this is because um, a, a minister who I respect greatly, his name is Dr. Ar Arnold Fruchtenbaum, that was his PhD thesis. He wrote his thesis on, quote unquote, Israelology, Israelology, the missing link in systematic theology. OK, now I love Dr. Fruchtenbaum because his research is fabulous and amazing. But I'm going to tell you, you know, this is a twelve hundred page book. It's super thick. And most of you out there don't want to try to read it because it's very dense. It's really good, but it's very dense and it's very dry. OK, and therefore trying to read it for most people is going to be really difficult. But for theologians and people who want to go there because you need to, outrageously important book. I can't tell you how important this book is because it puts the nation of Israel in its proper perspective within the scope and study of the entire Bible. And I cannot stress how important that is. Number one, for understanding the Bible, period, straight up. Straight up, you don't under, if you don't understand how God is dealing with the nation of Israel, you're never going to understand the Bible in general. Okay, you're, you're going to be way behind uh, where you should be, right? But then what becomes critically important is that 
by understanding Israelology, you can understand things like the social, political, and religious climate at the time of the birth of Christ, the social and religious, religious and political climate at the time of the ministry of Christ, and the social, religious, and social, pardon me, social, religious, and political climate uh, in the nation of Israel in the end times and understand how they all fit together biblically and scripturally. Very, very, very important. Can't stress how important that is, okay? So now let me make this is, I'm just going there because I can. I'm taking advantage of the opportunity because we're doing something a little bit different this week. I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity because right now we are living in the midst of eschatological events popping up on the radar like you wouldn't believe. So like I said, if you want to understand where we are in the end times, focus on the nation of Israel. Don't focus on the church. That doesn't mean you should ignore the church, okay? The church is very important, but the church is not going to tell you where we are on the eschatological timeline, so to speak, anywhere near like watching the nation of Israel is going to tell you this, okay? So the so I'm going to use, use my big fancy words here from systematic theology to make a point, right? Which is that if you want to understand end times, it is not, a lot of the times it's not an issue of eschatology. It's an issue of either ecclesiology or Israelology. Okay. If you understand where Israel is at on their timeline, then you understand eschatologically where we all are on the timeline. So things like the timing of the rapture, whether we are or are not in the great tribulation et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are questions that oftentimes are better answered, not from an eschatological point of view, but from either an, ecclesi an ecclesiological or an Israelological point of view, okay? So a lot of really big fancy words that mean keep your eye on the nation of Israel, right? So now I've taken a whole lot longer than I really intended to do a review of what we did a couple of weeks ago and why that was important to God Save the King, but also to take a moment and emphasize the fact that that's actually some pretty important biblical information that has a lot of application. It will help your understanding of the entire Bible. It will help your understanding of uh, Jesus's earthly ministry. It will help you understand the church epistles and why they are important and why they are distinct from the Old Testament. It will help you understand the book of Revelation. You'll never understand the book of Revelation if you don't understand that it is predominantly a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Otherwise, you won't get it, right? So in light of that, I want to share some similar information this week that once again is going to help us understand the chronology around the birth of Christ, but not just the chronology, but the environment, rather, is a better word, the atmosphere, the political atmosphere, the social atmosphere, the religious atmosphere at the birth of Christ, in Judea at the birth of Christ. And then also, this is going to be a similar lesson in the effect that you'll be able to take this and apply it to many other things. In other words, this will help you understand the Bible uh, broad scale, okay? So what I want to share with you today is a definition of the word religion, okay? And the reason for this is because if you examine the, the many of the world religions, okay? So if you examine and I'm using the word religion there generically for the moment, right? The way most people would use it. So if you examine the Christian religion, the Jewish religion, the Muslim religion, um, Buddhism, Taoism, and any of 2,000 other native religions around the world, you will discover that in the broad strokes, in general terms, all these religions have usually at least three, but most frequently five fundamental components in common, right? Now you've got to take, you got to strip away 
all of the variations and get it down to its fundamental component. And once you see the fundamental component, that's when you're able to say, oh, wow, I get it. That's that's how how these are similar and how they are distinct. They're similar in that they have the same fundamental component, but they're distinct in the fact that, well, this religion does it this way, and then this religion does it this way, okay? So what are these fundamental components? Okay, well, component number one is that most religions have what is known as a sacred space, okay? And I mean a literal geophysical space, okay? It can be an entire country. It can be a city. It can be a mountain. It can be a river, okay? That might be the geopolitical. It doesn't have to be political necessarily, but it's got to be a geophysical uh, space, okay? Now, those are relatively large areas, but sacred spaces can also be very, very small. They could be a very specific spot in a forest or in a grove of trees or in the desert. And then that very, very small spot could be marked by an identifying marker such as a sacred stone or a totem pole or something like that. So now you can kind of get the picture of why I'm talking about sacred spaces, okay? But probably the most common kind of sacred space is a building that was built, set apart, and dedicated for religious purposes. So these buildings have a variety of different names. We call them temples. We call them shrines. We call them synagogues. We call them mosques. We call them churches. Okay. So this is probably the most common type of sacred space is a building that was developed and then set apart and dedicated for religious purposes. Okay. And then sometimes even within the building, there are spaces that are divided into what we would call like the inner sanctum. Okay. So you've got a large space and then within it, a subspace. And then with that, within that a subspace and that by going deeper within this sacred space, this building, you're going deeper into the inner sanctum, the most holy place. So for example, the Jewish temple, right? See, that's how this relates to the Bible, the Jewish temple in the Bible or the tabernacle, you had the outer court, you had the holy place, and then you had the holy of holies. Okay. So that's component. Number one is almost all religions, have a sacred space. Okay. Now, let me grab a quick little drink here. Wet my lips. Okay. Now, the second feature that most religions have in common is that they have a holy man. Okay. Now, it could be a holy woman. Don't get me wrong. I'm using the phrase holy man as a convention because it's simple. Okay. A holy man or a holy woman, um, because now some religions even to this day, exclude women from being religious officials. And some religions exclude men from being religious officials. And some religions embrace both, right? But the holy person can therefore is usually primarily called either a priest or a priestess. But it can also be a rabbi, an imam, a guru, a shaman, you know, a minister, any one of a number of titles, okay? Okay. Uh, And frequently there is an entire specialized group of religious officials within a religion. In other words, it's a subset of the religion is you've got your religious officials, right? You have a group of religious officials and oftentimes they are differentiated from one each from one another by a kind of hierarchy that is very common. So for example, you've got some type of CEO, a chief executive officer at the top, a high priest, right? And then you've got the priests and then you've also then you've got the laity, the common people. So that's probably the most generic hierarchical division would simply be high priest, clergy, laity right? So that's what goes on in most religions, right? Now, again, if we want to use the Old Testament as our example, right? You've got the high priest, then you had the priests, which were the sons of Aaron, then you had the Levites, okay? And then you had the remainder 
of the 12 tribes of Israel. Or if you wanted to use another example, another example we could turn to very quickly would be Roman Catholic hierarchy, where you have the Pope, then you have the Cardinals, then you have the bishops, then you have the priests, then you have the laity. Okay. So, but once again, most religions have a holy man or an entire group of religious officials. Okay. So that's what we've got so far, a sacred space and a holy man, right? Now, feature number three, component number three that is common to most world religions is you have a sacred code, okay? Now, this could be a written code, such as the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, right? The Hindu Vedas, you know, these are all written codes, but it can also be an oral code, such as the Mishnah or the Sunnah or the Hadith. Now, the Sunnah and the Hadith and the Mishnah, they're all written down now, but they started as oral traditions, right? And then there's tons of world religions that only have oral traditions that were then later written down. In other words, they didn't start as a written code. They started as an oral code, but then later on they were written down. So in a lot of the Norse religions, their sagas, right? Their sacred stories were an oral tradition. Uh, the Native Americans had a extensive oral tradition. So now these, this sacred code could be a list of divine ordinances like thou shalt and thou shalt not. So divine ordinances and rules and things like that, guidelines, or it could also be simply a sacred story, or it could be a combination of both. Okay. Now, something I should mention is that in each of these cases, the sacred space, the holy man, and now the sacred code, part of what is important here is to recognize that they are set apart and distinct from the, so like in the case of the holy man, they're set apart from the common man, right? So like I mentioned, you have a, in a lot of religions, you have a hierarchical, um, organizational structure. So you've got high priest, priest, Levites, and see, and then you've got the laity, quote unquote, the rest of the nation of Israel, see, the common man, right? And this is critical. This is very, very critical to understanding the Old Testament. It's critical to understanding the New Testament because the New Testament sees a huge change, okay? Jesus takes this paradigm and turns it on its head, okay? So that's very important, and we were moving towards that at the time that Jesus was born. That's why I'm sharing this. I'm going to give you, I'm tipping my hand a little bit to tell you to stay tuned to the end of this episode and or make sure you tune in next episode because that's where you're going to see me take this information and dovetail it into why am I why am I even bothering with this? Why am I mentioning this? Because this is critical to understanding the environment, right? So once again, real quick, so you've got your holy place, your sacred space. Your sacred space is different than your common space, right? It's set apart for religious purposes. Then you've got your holy man. He is set apart for religious purposes, and he's different than the common man, right? Now you have a sacred code or a holy book, okay? Well, that book is set apart and different from all other ordinary books, okay? Now, the next thing you have, the next component you have is some type of sacred ritual, okay? Now, there's a lot of different potential sacred rituals, but I'm just going to pick one that is super, super, super common, okay? And that is a religious calendar, all right? That you are commemorating a sacred day. You've got you've got certain days of the week or days of the month or days of the year that are set apart for religious purposes. Every other day is ordinary, okay? But these days are holy days, which, of course, is where we get the word holiday. It's just a contraction of holy day, right? So these days were set apart for religious purposes, for for God to do things, for God's work and for God's use, right? So it's the same pattern, right? Sacred space, ordinary space, holy man, common man, sacred code, ordinary books, and now holy days, holidays, and then 
every other day. Okay. Now the final component, and I just realized as I'm doing this, I'm going to have to do a whole another teaching on, on this. And we'll do that a different day at a different time. But the final piece of the puzzle is that almost every major religion has a blood sacrifice. Now, some of you are probably listening and going, oh, well, no, that's not true. We, uh, 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 this religion doesn't. This, uh, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. Okay, time out. You got to take any modern religion, you got to run it back about a thousand years or 2,000 years or 5,000 years, and you will run face first into a blood sacrifice. Pretty much guaranteed. Many modern religions don't have a blood sacrifice, but they are usually rooted and grounded in blood sacrifice. Okay. So, and then obviously, once again, if we're using the Old Testament as our example, clearly the Old Testament had blood sacrifice. And see, and this was usually an annual sacrifice. And there's a reason for this that I won't get into today. Um, it's, again, it's extremely significant, very important for us to know and understand how and why blood sacrifice became common amongst all of the world's religions, okay? Why is that? There's actually a very good reason why that occurred. It's not a very pleasant reason. So uh, won't go there right now, but we'll do that some other time, right? But once again, every major religion at some point is rooted and grounded in a blood sacrifice. Okay, so now I've made a big deal out of the fact that you've got the sacred space and then the not sacred space. You got the holy man and then the not holy man. You've got the sacred code and then the not so sacred code. Then you've got the holy days and then the not so holy days. But when it comes to the blood sacrifice, all of a sudden, we don't have that distinction anymore. You can't say we've got the special sacrifice and then we've got the non-special sacrifice. The, the, the whole notion of a sacrifice is religious all by itself. That additional subcategorization does not exist here, right? Why I'm bringing that up is because now we're going to put it all together. How do these components function together? Well, it's really pretty simple. These five components, the sacred space, the holy man, the sacred code, the holy day, and the sacrifice are the foundation of all religion, okay? Because the way it works is, is that as prescribed by the sacred code, the holy man would perform the blood sacrifice in the sacred space on the holy day. There it is, right? Okay, now this is going to be great preparation for the next couple of segments I'm going to do of the show. I want you to stay tuned and tune in for the next couple of segments because we're going to talk about John the Baptist. We're going to talk about how he preceded his birth preceded the birth of Jesus Christ, and that is not just some coincidence. It's very significant why that happened. And then also, um, we're going to also talk about the Jewish calendar, right? Because the Jewish calendar figures significantly in the birth of Christ, okay? So having this as a little bit of a warm-up is really going to help us out. So let me say that again. The way these components function together is because you have the whole, according to the sacred code, because the sacred code will tell you how, how and when and where and why, and all that kind of stuff. According to the sacred code, the holy man performs the sacred ritual, the, the blood sacrifice in the sacred space on the holy day. Okay, that's how it works. So now, if we look at the old covenant, of the Bible or the Old Testament of the Bible, the nation of Israel, right? And we talk about their sacred spaces. They had a variety of sacred spaces. It starts with, here you go, because now we're, we're going to start to tie it in. I mean, I'm going to tie it in in much greater detail later, but you're going to start to see pieces of the puzzle, right? The promised land is a sacred space. Okay, 
to the Jewish religion, it is different than all other lands. It's the promised land. It is the sacred space. Okay. And then, as I mentioned, um, a lot of times you can start getting smaller subdivisions within the larger sacred space, right? So you've got the promised land. Then you've got the Levitical cities. Then you've got the city of Jerusalem where the Lord put his name, right? As the Bible says, then you've got the temple mount. Then you've got the temple itself. Then you've got the outer court. Then you have the holy place. Then you have the holy of holies. And then you have the Ark of the Covenant. And then you have the mercy seat. Sacred space, sacred space, sacred space from large to small. Promised land, Jerusalem, temple mount, outer court, holy place, holy of holies, Ark of the Covenant, mercy seat. Sacred space, right? So now then you've got the holy man. Okay, well, in the nation of Israel, you had the holy people, which is all 12 tribes, right? So everyone in Israel is set apart and different than all other people, okay? People want to understand why the Jews make this big deal about being the chosen people. Well, because they are. According to the Bible, they are the chosen people. They are different than every other nation on earth for a reason. Won't get into the rest of that right now, but there's good reason for that. So you got the 12 tribes, and then amongst the 12 tribes, you have the tribe of the Levites. And then amongst the Levites, you have the Aaronic priesthood, and then you've got the high priest. See? Holy man, right? And then hierarchy. Then you've got the sacred code in the Old Testament. You've got the Tanakh, the Torah, the stone tablets that Moses brought down out of Mount Sinai and kept in the Ark of the Covenant. Interesting how all these pieces put together. And then you've got the, the calendar, right? And we will talk about this in detail in a future episode. You've got all manner of religious holidays or holy days throughout the year, okay? So you've got the year of Jubilee. You've got the sabbatical year. You've got the new moon. You've got the weekly Sabbath. And then most important, you've got the seven annual Hebrew feasts, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, of First Fruits, Pentecost, the Day of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? And then finally, okay, you've got the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice, and I won't go, I won't take the time, but you've got sin offerings, guilt offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings, offerings and then a variety of animals that can be used as the animal sacrifice, okay? So the way this all was put together in the Hebrew religion is in their system of atonement. And there was an individual system of atonement, and then there was a corporate system of atonement. The individual system of atonement was, if I was a Hebrew believer under the Old Testament and I committed a sin, I would bring a sacrificial animal to the holy place, see? And now the, the animal would be determined in part by my financial status and in part by the degree of the sin I committed, right? But I would bring this sacrificial animal to the holy place, to the tabernacle or the temple or the Levitical city where the priest, the holy man, okay, would help me with the sacrifice and make atonement for my transgression. And we would do this on a holy day, right? And then we would do it, of course, according to the ordinances prescribed in the sacred code. So that's the individual system of atonement. And then the corporate system of atonement means that according to the Torah, in the land of Israel, in the city of Jerusalem, in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies one day a year on the Feast of Yom Kippur, the uh, the all right the um, the day of atonement okay he would enter the holy of holies and then he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat on the ark of the covenant okay which inside it are the stone tablets that Moses brought down off of Mount Sinai okay so there it is on the day of atonement you have these pieces of the puzzle all fitting together 
Okay, so you have this spectacular example of the Hebrew religion with its sacred space, its holy man, its sacred code, its holy day, and then the blood sacrifice. Now, we are quickly running out of time, so let me jump forward really quickly and start to put this together for why this is important for God Save the King, and then also give you a little bit of kind of extra juice here on why uh, this is important for us as New Covenant followers of Jesus Christ, okay? Because, so for example, when you're talking about the sacred space, here you go, let's put it, let's, let me just, I'll just cut right straight to the chase here. Let's talk about it. Sacred space. Under the old covenant, that was a geophysical sacred space. It was the land of Israel, city of Jerusalem, the temple, outer court, holy place, holy of holies, right? But then along comes Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, who says, I am the temple of God, right? And boy, did he piss off the religious officials when he said that right? That Jesus is the temple of God. See? So we're seeing a radical shift, and you know where I'm going. I'm going to go through all five components, right? So the next component, of course, is the holy man, right? Well, the Bible plainly teaches us that not only was Jesus the Messiah, the Messiah, the King, the Mashiach Nagid, the anointed one, the Bible also tells us that he was designated by God as a high priest according to the order of, of Melchizedek, okay? Hebrews chapter 5, right? Okay, by the way, um, you know, Jesus, when he, when he said he was the temple, it was one of the examples is in John chapter 2 where he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, right? But he was speaking of the temple of his body right? He was speaking of himself because he was standing in the temple when he said it, right? So, I mean, because there he is, he's making the contrast. Destroy this temple, meaning one that we're standing in, but he goes, no, no, I mean this temple, my body. Destroy this temple, then in three days I'll raise it up, right? So then, so he's the temple of God. Then it says he is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then, oh, by the way, sacred code, in the beginning, John 1, 1, John 1, 1, and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And this is a direct reference to Jesus. It's not talking about the Bible. It's talking about Jesus because then in John 1, 14, it tells us, and the Word became flesh, okay? The word became flesh. So the word that is being referred to in John 1 and 1, 1 and 1, 2 is the pre-incarnate Jesus of Nazareth, who then became flesh. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so he is so he is the sacred code. See, and you can see where I'm going. Old Testament temple, Jesus Christ, I am the temple. Old Testament, high priest, priests, Levites, etc. Jesus Christ is the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, Old Testament, Torah, the scrolls, the written word of God, the stone tablets. No, 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 no. Jesus, I am the word of God. He is the word of God, right? And you can also read it in Hebrews where it says, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow. And then in verse 13 of Hebrews uh, for it says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. Personal pronoun, not its sight, his sight. Okay. Anyway, so now, right? Now the next component, the holy day, right? Okay. So just like all these other symbols that we've seen throughout the old covenant, the weekly and monthly Sabbaths or the annual Sabbath, right? Okay. We are taught in the New Testament, the new covenant, say that it says, let no one judge you. Okay. 
with regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, right? Because the, here you go. These things were shadows of what was to come, but the substance is Christ. The substance is Jesus of Nazareth, right? And then in Hebrews 4, again, interestingly enough, it, we read that there remains therefore a Sabbath rest to the people of God and for the one who has entered his rest, right? In other words, who is in Christ has rested from his works as God did also. So all of the holy days, all of the Sabbaths point to the person of Jesus Christ. He is our Sabbath rest, okay? And then finally, of course, you've got the blood sacrifice. And this one is so obvious, it would be laughable if it weren't so amazingly significant. Jesus is the Lamb of God. John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, okay? Jesus is the Lamb of God. So there it is. You've got all five components of the Hebrew religion fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the sacred space. He is the temple of God. He is the holy man. He is the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He is the word of God, right? He is the Sabbath rest, and he is or was the ultimate sacrifice, all fulfilled in Jesus Christ, okay? And then finally, we have to wrap up here, but what a great place to wrap up. We have what the new covenant teaches about believers, about followers of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you're a believer, I'm a believer. If you're a believer listening to this, this is what scripture says about you and me. Okay. It tells us that we are the temple of God, both individually and collectively. Okay. Right? 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells within you. Right? The Spirit of God lives in me, lives in you, lives in us as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. So now we are the temple. Okay? Uh, next, the, um, the holy man. Right? The new covenant tells us that we are, are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. We are all priests. There is no hierarchy in the body of Christ. We are all priests, right? So you find that in 1 Peter chapter 2 in verses both both verses 5 and 9, right? Okay, moving on because we're just running out of time here. We got to wrap it up. Um, New Covenant teaches us that we have the law of God written in our hearts. In other words, the word of God is now written because we've been given a new heart, right? We've been born again. We've been saved, right? We've been set apart. We've been given a new heart. We are a new creation in Christ, okay? So therefore, the law of God is written in our hearts. Romans 7 tells us that I delight in the law of God after the inward man. The word of God is written in our hearts. And then now, of course, finally, uh, or not, you got two more. You got the holy day, right? But we are told, okay, once again, back to Colossians and Hebrews, same verses I cited before, we're not to judge one another in light of holy days, holidays, because there is no Sabbath, Christian Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath. That's because in Christianity, every day, is a holy day. Every day is dedicated to God. Every day is a Sabbath. Every day we rest in Christ's accomplished work as if it were the Sabbath, because it is the Sabbath every day. Okay. And then finally, there's no more blood sacrifice because Jesus did solve that once and for all by being the final blood sacrifice. Whereas we are told that, you know, once he made one sacrifice for sins, then he sat down on the right hand of God. And that, you know, blood sacrifice, we don't have time to go there, is really something God had to do, not something he really truly wanted to do. But to wrap up here, here we go. 
one last time, the five main components of religion are the sacred space, the holy man, the sacred code, the holiday, and the blood sacrifice. So under the Old Testament, you had the temple, right? Then you had the priest and high priest, you had the Torah, and then you had the Jewish calendar, and then you had the literal blood sacrifice. But then when Jesus came, he said, I am the temple, I am the high priest, I am the word of God, I am the Sabbath rest, and then he was the ultimate blood sacrifice. And now under the new covenant, we are the temple, we are priests, we have the word of God written in our hearts. Every day is holy unto the Lord, and there is no more blood sacrifice, only the one-time ultimate sacrifice of Jesus of Nazareth, the Lamb of God. So there it is, perfect timing. It's a great place to wrap up. Thank you all for joining me here today on God Save the King. Remember, you can listen every Friday night at 10 p.m. Eastern on the Truth Be Told radio network. Also, please make sure you check out my website, www.godsavetheking.org. And then also all of these episodes, not only can you watch them or listen to them on the Truth Be Told radio network, you can find them on my YouTube channel, which is simply God Save the King. But remember, you can listen to God Save the King every Friday night at 10 p.m. on the Truth Be Told radio network. Once again, you can listen on Alexa, Google, and Apple home devices. You can call in at 641-741-2866 or 717-567-4977. You can go to the Truth Be Told Radio Network website and click on the big listen button and listen to God Save the King and all of the great shows on the Truth Be Told Radio Network. So finally... This is Tim Kyes with GodSaveTheKing.org from the Truth Be Told Radio Network, signing off. See you next week.